Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today for the Dr. Cog Board Work Session for Wednesday, December 2nd. I'm Ashley Stolzman, the Vice Chair of Dr. Cog. I'm calling the meeting to order. We're holding the meeting electronically because of COVID-19 and it's being recorded. So uh, we will take attendance based on the attendance list and the panel today. And so we'll handle that that way. And that takes us to our public comment period. I request that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the Board of Directors. So we will unmute the phone lines at this time. If any members that have logged on through the computer uh, would like to make a public comment, go ahead and raise your hand. And any members of the phone, you'll be unmuted at this time. Are there any public comments today? All right, seeing no one, we will move on. Thank you so much, everybody. So our next item um, is we will accept the summary of the November 4th, 2020 board work session. It's in your packet as attachment A. And that brings us to our fourth agenda item today, which is the results of the 2050 small area forecast gap analysis. Mr. Calvert, our Director of Regional Planning and Development is going to take us through that item. But before I turn it over to him, I'd like to um, get everyone's attention because he has a really engaging and fun exercise for us today. And so you're going to use a website called menti.com to be able to answer some quiz questions. It's gonna be very fun. So get out your smartphones or open another internet browser and go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And the passcode for our quiz is 347075 3. So it's menti.com 347075 3. And Brad will tell you all that again, but I just wanted to get everybody pointed toward that in the right direction. So, Mr. Calvert, take it away. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It looks as though everyone should be able to see my screen. Can come on and give, give me a verbal if that's, that's the case? That is the case. Yes. Awesome. Great. Um, so uh, thank you, and, and Ashley did a great job of, of sort of setting this up. Uh, as noted on the slide, this is actually kind of part two uh, of a presentation that I uh, delivered at the October board uh, meeting. Uh, as noted in the memo and uh, on the title of the slide, this item attempts to compare uh, Dr. Cog's recently completed 2050 small area forecast uh, to uh, regional aspirations and areas of continuous improvement, uh, also known as outcomes and objectives, identified uh, in, in Metrovision. Um, one important note uh, that I did convey to the chair, but I'll mention to this group as well. Uh, when I looked over the packet this afternoon, I did notice that there's an older, slightly different version uh, in the PDF uh, of the packet. There are three slides that I'm showing tonight that are also in that pack packet, but they are slightly different. Really just some graphical changes that, that we made uh, to better communicate the material, but we will make sure that the PDF of the agenda uh, that's associated with this calendar uh, reflects uh, what you actually see uh, this evening. Um, so uh, just a quick orientation to um, a few uh, recent and current activities uh, that are directly uh, related to this item. Um, in September, my colleague Andy Taylor shared uh, the 2050 um, small area forecast, kind of an overview uh, with you that, that's in a forecast for both household and employment uh, in the region out to the year 2050. Um, that's obviously one of the key assumptions in the uh, 2050 Metrovision Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, the board approved uh, the fiscally constrained uh, project and program priorities element of the RTP uh, last month, uh, and the public review draft of the RTP is expected uh, in the coming months. Uh, Andy's on the line again tonight. It's my kind of phone or friend. If you ask some really specific detailed questions, I may uh, lean into Andy to help out uh, with that. Um, uh, in October, we aim to share information related to sort of how the region is growing. Uh, in the October presentation, uh, we brought forward, uh, in addition to small area forecast information, uh, other external data sources uh, to supplement what we were sharing uh, from the forecast, uh, including uh, data focused on cost burdened households and access to opportunity across five dimensions. Uh, this afternoon's presentation really relies exclusively on those small area forecasts that, that I've mentioned, and we're, we sort of attempt to answer uh, kind of a, a set of questions uh, related to where the region is growing. Um, for those that have not uh, seen this before uh, or want a re quick refresher, uh, this is uh, sort of an overall snapshot of Dr. Cog's strategic uh, planning model. 
Uh, the Metro Vision Plan picks up the model at the overarching themes and outcomes altitude that you see sort of towards the top of uh, the triangle and carries it forward all the way through the identification of strategic initiatives uh, shown at the bottom of the, of the graphic. Uh, the framing for both the presentation in October as well as this afternoon's uh, presentation is really at that objective uh, level. Uh, object objectives closely align with outcomes and are designed to, all, to allow us to understand if we're moving uh, towards the associated outcome. Uh, the slides that I'm going to share, uh, admittedly, are a little data heavy, uh, so there's a good chance I may jump straight to the data to get you, get you as oriented as quickly as to what you see or seen on the slide, uh, but uh, there will be a corresponding MetroVision objective kind of in the title block of each slide, so just in case I don't, I don't note that, you can, you can make uh, that, that orientation on your own. Uh, so as the chair mentioned, uh, we are going to start off uh, with uh, a quick uh, anonymous uh, quiz. Um, we're really going to sort of uh, help tell, use this to help tell the story of uh, population and employment growth uh, over a 40-year period in the Denver region. Uh, I'll leave it to you to decide if you think uh, some of the answers are surprising or if they are what you expected. Um, on the next slide, you'll see the code uh, that the chair mentioned uh, at the prior to me presenting uh, that you'll need to enter to take the quiz, but I'll pause that slide for a second as well. Um, and that's the code you use to ultimately enter, enter your results and, and to participate. So here's the first uh, of these uh, quiz slides. I will pa pause on this slide uh, for just a second so that you can uh, log in. Uh, that code that you see at the top of the slide is exactly what uh, the chair uh, read out to you prior uh, to getting going um, on this. Um, uh, you, if you do navigate to menti.com, you should find a very simple landing page that, that allows you to uh, enter that code uh, so that you can participate. Um, so again, if you're on the phone uh, and you can't see the slides, uh, that code is 3470753. I see some folks are already jumping into this. Uh, so one more time, if you want to participate in the quiz, please go ahead and go to menti.com. And again, the code is 3470753 and it will be on top of all the slides. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, anyone uh, in the audience is welcome to attend. These are just sort of fun uh, quiz slides. You'll pretty quickly get a rhythm and pattern to these quiz slides. Uh, I'll be asking which county experienced the most growth, uh, first population, uh, and then employment uh, during uh, a certain decade. So many of you are already uh, jumping ahead and taking uh, part of the quiz. So uh, this first uh, quiz question is which county saw uh, the largest employment growth um, from 1990 through uh, 2000. And you can see uh, the choices in front of you. We did not include uh, Clear Creek and Gilpin uh, because they've been relatively um, modest in their growth. And also our planning area only covers a portion of Weld County, but I'll mention a few things uh, about those areas uh, as well after, after the quiz. So I think everyone has had a fair amount of time uh, on this slide. So I'll just give everybody maybe a few more seconds to, to enter. This, I, for those that are using this for the first time, I tend to like to use Minty uh, on my phone, but you can use it on a computer as well. Uh, the phone just kind of helps me keep my, my screens uh, straight. And, and I'll just um, interject here. It looks like most people have figured out how to get over to menti.com, but Lisa did put in the chat a link to the website and the input code if anybody needs to look it up. And it's also at the top of this slide. Great, thank you for that. Uh, so with that, we'll do uh, the big reveal, uh, and I'll share others as well. Uh, I think obviously most of you uh, were correct in this. Uh, Douglas County uh, had uh, the largest amount of population growth in our region between 1990 and 2000. If my memory serves, I didn't look this up, but I remember this from back in the day. Uh, I believe Douglas County actually had the highest percentage growth during that decade of any county in the country. Uh, so obviously, if they if they hit that metric, then they probably uh, were on top for our region uh, as well. Going to the next slide, and again, you'll kind of see uh, the rhythm and pattern here. So we'll advance a decade. Uh, so which county saw the largest population uh, increase from 2000 to 2010? So moving a little more current uh, for this question.
my guess is that's probably a, a pretty good uh, amount of coverage uh, for this one. Uh, I think people were tempted to, to offer another answer, uh, but again, actually uh, Douglas County again, so two decades uh, in a row uh, in terms of largest uh, number of, uh, largest increase in population growth uh, in the region over, over the 2000 to 2010 uh, time period. Uh, so moving forward to the next decade, now we're kind of in kind of the recent past and even some of uh, the current. Uh, so same question, largest uh, population increase uh, from 2010 through, through 2020. All right, I'll go ahead and, and do the big reveal again. Uh, as you can see, uh, Denver, uh, City and County of Denver, actually by a pretty uh, wide margin. And interestingly enough, this was by far the largest decade uh, in total population growth that Denver has experienced in, in 100 years, uh, even 40 or 50,000 uh, more than the, the boom uh, during 1940 to 1950. So, a really incredible uh, growth decade uh, for the city and county of Denver. So we will ask uh, one uh, future-oriented version of this, and, and again, this is based on uh, our most recent forecast, uh, which which is really informed uh, by the State Demography Office, uh, which county is forecast to see the largest population growth increase from 2020 to 2030. Great, I got a lot, a lot of folks going all in on, on Adams County for this one. And you are correct. Uh, over 100,000 uh, additional population expected uh, in Adams County uh, over the next decade. So as you can see, over the last 40 years, a fair amount of diversity uh, in terms of leading growth, uh, in terms of population uh, throughout the region. So now we'll transition uh, to the employment side of this, uh, again, going back to 1990, and then we'll sort of go through the same uh, for four decades. So which county is still the largest employment increase uh, from 1990 to 2000. So we're talking population in the first section and jobs in the second. Pretty good split there between Denver and Arapahoe County in terms of folks Oh, had a few more jump in there. I'll hold a second. Again, I'll, I'll share the data with you. Uh, and Arapahoe County is uh, the correct answer uh, for the 1990 to 2000 uh, period. But you can see, uh, obviously, a fair amount of growth, uh, job growth throughout the region uh, during a, that obviously relatively high growth uh, decade. Uh, so fast forwarding again, one decade, uh, so same sort of sense of the question, uh, largest employment uh, increase uh, in this case from 2000 to 2010. All right, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the reveal with, as you can see, a fair amount of folks uh, choosing Arapahoe County, sort of going back to, the, to what we saw in the uh, first version, and then uh, City and County of Denver. And this is the scary decade. Uh, so you actually see a fair amount of uh, counties that experienced negative uh, employment growth uh, dur during this decade. So Douglas County was actually the leader in employment growth during this time frame, as you can see, pretty uh, drastic job declines in, in, in Denver, as well as uh, some of our other counties. Uh, this is what happens uh, when you have two recessions uh, in a single decade. Uh, you get some pretty ugly uh, job figures. So going in, uh, we're almost to the end of these. So again, same thing, largest employment increase uh, by county uh, 2010 to 2020. 
so are more recent. Great, I'll go ahead and go uh, to the re reveal. Got a lot of folks uh, uh, weighing in with, with Denver as their answer, uh, and that's exactly right. Um, you probably saw the last uh, graph and remembered those those pretty horrific recessions and then realized there was actually a fair amount of bounce back and recovery uh, in the most recent decade. And obviously Denver um, did very well, but also had a, a relatively deep hole uh, to get out of in terms of, of job growth uh, over the past uh, 10 years. So again, last of the of the quiz slides. Which county is forecast to see the largest employment increase from 2020 to 2030? And an important note on this that I'm sure we've mentioned the last few times we've presented this information, uh, this forecast does sort of predate COVID. Uh, so uh, that is obviously a pretty big uh, disclaimer. Um, these are long run forecasts. There, there are in some ways recessions that are baked in, uh, but I don't think they're they're really specifically uh, considering the time frame for kind of what we're experiencing now in terms of the struggling economy. So a lot of folks uh, going with Adams County for the next decade. And you're right, uh, but we would call it a tie. Uh, both Adams County and Douglas County pretty much at a very similar number, 66,000 uh, for both Adams County and Douglas County uh, over the next 10-year year period. So if you answer either one of those, we'll definitely give you uh, credit for, for getting that correct. I appreciate everybody sort of hanging in there. This We just thought this was a good way to uh, share um, sort of what's been happening over the next over the last 40 years, including looking forward. Uh, 10 years. I'll mention maybe a few other uh, factoids or kind of did you knows uh, that weren't included in, in the quiz. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Gilpin County uh, population peaked around 1900, uh, just shy of 6700. Uh, the forecasting work the state demography office uh, puts together uh, establishes that, that the Gilpin County's population will kind of hover around 6200 uh, by the mid 2030s and will pretty much uh, remain at that level uh, throughout the forecast period. Uh, Clear Creek County um, on a similar trajectory, uh, though it surpassed its 1880 peak of 7,800 in, in the 90s. Um, uh, city and County of Broomfield um, is forecast to have their largest population growth uh, actually during this decade, so 2020 to 2030. Um, and then only Adams and Weld County have their largest single decade growth periods later uh, with pretty much everyone else having kind of like a crest or a peak uh, that occurred in a previous decade. So the for current forecast uh, anticipates Adams having their strongest population growth uh, period from 2030 to 2040 and Weld uh, County from 2040 uh, to 2050. So, so just some, some things that are on the horizon uh, for that. Um, so, with, so with that, um, I'm gonna sort of start with kind of the, the primary uh, part of the presentation, uh, hopefully building on kind of what we just went through. Um, throughout the presentation, uh, you'll see slides uh, that uh, present um, analysis that requires us to classify data just to simply be able to maybe tell the story. Uh, over the next few slides, that's through identifying common characteristics in terms of, of density, either as we understand household and employment density today or what we were predicting uh, in the future. Uh, on the two slides we're going to look at uh, with on the household density side of things related to growth, uh, we're kind of using three classifications of density, uh, what we're calling sort of sparse, uh, really meaning less than one household per acre. Uh, you're not actually seeing this, this category on the map, but you'll see it on the next map. Kind of something that we're calling low and medium density uh, and generally averaging between two and 10 uh, households per acre and high density areas of more than 10 households per acre. And all those densities are really gross, uh, meaning they're calculated across an entire uh, census block. Uh, on this slide, uh, we're showing the, the extent to which the low, uh, medium density and high density blocks are capturing uh, the, the growth uh, forecasted uh, out to the year uh, 2050. Uh, so you can see there's basically so that arrow is sort of uh, pointing out that 
7% uh, of the region's forecasted household growth is occurring in areas that transition from low uh, median density, that two to 10 uh, households per acre to that high density category. Uh, interestingly enough, um, of those, uh, those areas that are transitioning during the forecast period, 94% uh, of those growth areas are well served today by high capacity or high, high frequency transit. Uh, this may suggest um, that proximity, proximity to transit is a key uh, contributor to this change, uh, specifically which areas are, are maybe seeing that, that transition um, happen. Um, next arrow is sort of pointing to um, an observation uh, that approximately 9% of the expected household growth uh, occurs in high density zones that were considered high density uh, in the year uh, 2010. And then finally, you see uh, approximately 14% of the forecasted growth in households is occurring in medium density zones, those, that sort of low and medium density zone, uh, and remaining there. So again, that's about sort of your two to 10 acre, two to 10 households per, per acre. Um, as noted, and so that sort of summary on the slide, uh, approximately 30% of the anticipated household growth uh, will occur in these areas that were classified as uh, medium or, or high density in 2010. Uh, so now we'll go to the other side of that, of that uh, coin, um, really kind of the, what we were sort of calling sparse uh, to, to kind of come up with a name. Um, again, less than one uh, household per acre. Uh, your eyes, if you're looking at the map on the right, I promise you we're not playing tricks on you. You are seeing some of these areas, even in sort of the center of the core uh, of the region. Uh, many of those areas do not, that you're seeing on the map, uh, do not currently have significant amounts of residential development and largely commercial or, or other uses, but based on local plans, zoning, uh, and guidance from local staff, these areas in our forecast will see an increasing amount of residential development. Uh, you can see the pattern on the map that you may be expected. Uh, you know, residential growth in areas uh, and other parts of the region. Uh, in many ways, this is kind of easier to see uh, because those census blocks actually tend to be larger. Uh, so the pattern, at least visually, is also uh, easily to discern uh, when you're looking at a, at a, at a screen uh, as we all are today. Um, a similar set of maybe quick uh, transportation uh, notes, and you can see that this type of from sparse to either medium or low density is accounting for about 50% of the household growth um, over the next 30 years. Um, about 50% um, of the household growth sh uh, shown uh, in, in this kind of category, uh, those starting in the sparse zones and moving up uh, to either medium or high density fall within that same high frequency or high capacity uh, transit area I mentioned previously and about 85% of that type of household growth falls within the existing RTD service area. Uh, the job, the job uh, side of things that I'm showing on this slide is a little bit uh, sort of simpler and hopefully easier uh, to, to pick up. Um, really just showing kind of two categories of job classification areas, again, based on density, uh, sort of less than 10 jobs per acre and more than 10 jobs per acre as a reference on uh, the map on the slide uh, is really showing those high employment density blocks uh, from 2010. Uh, as you can see uh, in the slide, uh, there is a significant plurality uh, of share of job growth that remains in that sort of lower uh, density uh, job ca uh, classification. Uh, frankly, this really isn't all that uh, surprising Surprising, given that um, you know many employment generators think retail, schools, uh, other convenience services uh, tend to follow household growth, uh, meaning that as, as household growth expands or is decentralized, it's likely also going to yield some amount of decentralized job growth uh, as well. Uh, but on the other side of, of that particular uh, coin, you can see uh, that the small area forecast does suggest uh, some amount of aggregation of employment as well. Uh, with you see the sort of bigger blocked arrow uh, in the middle as well as the one at the bottom. Uh, combining those, 54% of the region's job growth occurs in areas that in 2050 are in that high density uh, job area classification. We'll talk a little bit about sort of job uh, uh, concentrations uh, in a future slide as well. Uh, much of this growth occurs in areas that are not job centers today. Um, they are, or they are expansions of those exi existing job centers. That's that sort of 37% uh, arrow, um, meaning that they were not high density in 2010, but transitioned to that category uh, in 2050. Um, as with a uh, couple of notes I'm, I made on the household forecast, uh, there also does appear to, to be a connection between 
uh, job growth in centers and the location of high capacity and high frequency transit. Uh, we estimate that 95% of the high density job areas in 2010 that attract additional jobs uh, through 2050 are, are well served uh, by transit. So going to this next slide, a slightly um, different approach, but sort of a, a similar uh, story. Um, on the last slide, I sort of I, I shared uh, location characteristics of household and employment growth through kind of um, uh, sort of le relative concentrations of household and uh, uh, employment density. On this si slide, we'll look at both household and employment growth relative to uh, the, the 2010. Uh, urban air, urbanized area as defined by the Census Bureau. Uh, sort of, you can see the, the slide is sort of split into two sections. Um, on the left hand side, we're focusing on share of growth. Uh, so, the amount of growth experienced between 2020 and 2050 relative uh, to the urbanized area that existed in 2010. And then on the right hand side, you're seeing sort of share of total. Uh, I'll start uh, on the right, on the, excuse me, on the left hand side of the slide. Uh, that darkest blue area in sort of the lower left hand corner of the slide um, represents that 2010 uh, urbanized area and shows the share of household and employment growth between 2020 and 2050 uh, that our recently completed forecast uh, locates within this area. So 62% of household growth uh, occurs uh, over that over this 30 year period um, in that uh, area and 84% of, of job growth. Additionally, the figure also shows in that sort of uh, lighter blue uh, area as well, um, and uh, an area that is sort of a half mile expansion or extension um, of that urbanized area as well. Um, so with, with that, you, you can see um, that between um, that sort of half mile buffer um, and the darker blue, uh, approximately 90% of the job growth forecasted between 2020 and 2050 lands within that 2010 urbanized area or that or that buffer. On the other side of that, um, approximately 22% of the region's household uh, growth is landing outside of both the half mile buffer and uh, the 2010 uh, urbanized area. So a pretty different pattern overall in terms of household and employment growth. As I mentioned before, uh, the right hand slot, side of the slide uh, it's more on the thinking of total share. So all things, things that existed uh, in uh, 2020 and then adding that growth on, on top of, of those areas. Um, so you can see pretty clearly that in 2020, um, they both really had a very similar share, both being households and employment. 93% uh, of jobs and 93% of households uh, were located, um, they were present in 2020, were located in that 2010 urbanized area. Um, but you can see the effect, sort of air quotes here, of, of leakage uh, outside of that boundary over the over the 30 year uh, period of the forecast. Um, but worth noting, even with nearly 40% of the region's anticipated household growth occurring outside of that 2010 boundary, overall there's a relatively modest drop in the share of households located within the boundary from that 93% uh, number to 85%. Uh, if you thought the last few slides were complicated, this one's probably as, as complicated as it's going to get. So please uh, uh, hang with me. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best uh, to, to make this uh, work for everybody. Um, on the last slide, I shared sort of location characteristics of, of household and employment growth uh, through that sort of single geography, the 2010 uh, census uh, urbanized area. Uh, on this slide, we're going to add a little bit of nuance uh, to that story, um, but with that nuance, again kind of comes some visual complexity but i'll do my best to use some animations to, to help out um, what you're seeing the sort of base visualization that's on the screen um, at the moment uh, is household growth and employment growth in 10-year increments so those colors that are sort of sitting above the purple uh, the purple is uh, households and employment through uh, 2020 um, and so you can see households on the top and jobs uh, uh, on, the, on the bottom uh, we click, we pick sort of a sort of semi-arbitrary uh, center point of the region, the Daniels and Fisher, Fisher Tower. Uh, could have easily just as been Dr. Cog's office, office, but Doug has a great view of the tower, uh, and it's just a block away, so it felt like a, an iconic landmark uh, to use. Um, 
so these two visualizations show the amount of growth in one mile increments uh, closest to the tower on the left, locations farther out from the tower uh, on the right. So we're stretching from zero miles all the way out to, to really 30 miles. Um, so before I note uh, some more specific observations, just, just a quick mention that both the y-axis uh, for both of these is also the same, sort of your zero to, to 200,000. Uh, so just to note, note that comparison. So I'll add just a little bit of orientation to kind of, if you don't know sort of the crow flies distance uh, from locations to the, to the tower, a few things to maybe uh, help you sort of sort out where, where things are. Uh, first sort of throwing 225 and, and uh, E470 Northwest Parkway as sort of some infrastructure uh, oriented guidepost, now adding uh, some jurisdictions as well, general uh, location in terms of distance from the, from the Daniels Fisher uh, Tower. In general, you'll see a pretty uh, uh, close to even distribution of sort of household growth by distance uh, from uh, there um, in that upper visualization. Uh, but I'll add some, some other sort of landmarks as well, um, some sort of development and institutional landmarks, uh, all the way from like our old office building, which was at 1290 Bro uh, Broadway, which is a little less than a mile uh, from the tower. Uh, all the way out to something like uh, CU Boulder. I think Folsom Field is right at 23 miles as the crow flies uh, from, the, from the tower. That zero to one mile sort of period on the uh, increment on the job slide, basically is a generous definition of the central business district. Uh, go out maybe five or six miles, you're bringing in things like Belmar, Lowry, and DU. Uh, double that uh, going out about 13 miles, again, as the, as the crow flies from the tower. Uh, you bring in things like Interlochen to the northwest, uh, Highlands Ranch uh, uh, due south of the tower. Both of those are, are, are roughly uh, the same distance. On the uh, job side of things, you probably do notice a little bit more uh, concentration uh, in the bands uh, that are uh, within uh, about 15 miles of the tower. Uh, again, sort of that zero to 15 mile, kind of a halfway point of this visualization with some clear outliers such as uh, DEN, uh, the airport, or, or CU Boulder. Uh, I'll add one last um, element to the slide, and now you're at full animation with this uh, slide. Um, on the household side, so I'll flip back to the top of the slide, um, it's pretty easy to see that there is a fair amount of um, concentration um, in that sort of 13 to 20 mile, 21 mile band. Uh, from, from the tower, and I'll mention kind of a few quick little um, factoids about that. Just that um, area alone um, is capturing about 45% of all forecasted household growth. Um, I'll also use this as an opportunity to, for a quick reminder about the general conversation that we've had with you over the last uh, uh, few times we've presented this material about sort of deceleration of growth um, in the region. Uh, between 2020 and 2030, this sort of growth zone, that sort of upper red oval, uh, again, between 13 and 21 miles from downtown, will add about 90,000 households uh, during the next decade. Um, fast forward uh, a few years to 2040 to 2050, that same area is still a relatively significant attractor of, of household growth. Um, it will, will bring in approximately 30,000 less households, so 60,000 households uh, compared to 90,000. But that will account for actually a majority, 53% of all household growth uh, in the region during that, that period. So now again, dropping down to the, to the employment side of this, um, the oval on this slide is pointing to some pretty high performing areas in terms of job growth, uh, kind of in that downtown zone, all the way out to about, about 20 miles um, out from uh, downtown. Um, the area that would cover out to about 13 miles uh, from the tower, so mile zero to mile 13, accounts for about 60% of the region's employment growth between 2020 and 2050, with pretty steady performance uh, throughout the entire uh, period. I think for each decade, it's like one decade it's 60%, one decade it's 61%, one decade it's 62%, really steady uh, in terms of its, its ability to attract the zone's ability to track job growth uh, over the entire forecast period. Uh, so, go ahead. Sorry about that. Yep, sorry about that, Brad. We're just going to stop here for a couple of hands that are raised. Oh, and thank so, you, thank you. take questions from folks who have them. 
at this time. So the first question that we have is from Director Sandgren. And you should I think be I'm unmuted. Can you hear there. me? Yes, we can. All right. Um, thanks for the presentation. It is hard to follow all this. It's a lot of information, but <laughs> um, I guess the only um, concern, and I think this slide right here is is a testament to this concern, but um, for us in Thornton, um, you know, we've had in the past some issues with just not showing the data that shows the growth of jobs versus the growth of housing. And so we have a lot of areas for affordable attainable housing, but not necessarily the same number of opportunities for jobs. And so our staff is just asking um, if it would be possible to see the affordable attainable housing and jobs as connected items rather than isolated items so that we're not left out again. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that, that's exactly what we're trying to sort of uncover uh, during these presentations is as us, as Dr. Cog staff kind of sharing some observations uh, from the current forecast, get some feedback from uh, board directors about sort of additional things you want to learn about, and we'll obviously come come forward and, and have uh, those conversations as well. And obviously, um, last time uh, in October at the board meeting, there was a fair amount of conversation around sort of the affordable and attainable uh, housing side of things. So we can definitely bring forward some connective uh, tissue uh, that brings the, the job side of that uh, conversation uh, to the forefront as well. Yeah, I appreciate how fluid this is. Um, I mean, it's constantly changing and now we have a pandemic to add to it. So thank yeah. you so much. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Director Sandra. The next um, comment is a point of interest from Director Shaw. And I just thought it'd be great if you would share what you put in the question box with the group. And so if you could unmute, there you go. Sure. Um, as a point of interest in the pioneering days, distance from Denver was measured from the intersection of Colfax and Broadway. The four mile house in Glendale is four miles from that point, 17 mile in Arapahoe County is 17 miles and so on. It's, uh, but uh, I like the DNF tower as well. Thank you, that is awesome. Any other questions or comments um, at this point through the presentation? All right, uh, Mr. Calvert, take it away. Uh, and thank you, Madam Chair, for uh, interrupting me. I was sort of on a roll, and I, I know how complicated this is, so I definitely appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to spend a little bit more time if folks have, have questions. Um, so I'll transition again um, back to kind of the housing uh, side of this. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm jumping back and forth, but it kind of helps sort of tell the story, I think, a little bit. Um, in the, this presentation series, which really kind of started uh, with that overview from Andy in September, where we were just sort of sharing basic forecast information, including kind of the process to develop uh, what is the product. We're really sharing some details around today. Uh, we referred to uh, sort of this idea of something that we internally refer to as a as sort of a development pipeline uh, in the region, really trying to understand, because frankly, we, we heard from you and your staff that it was important for us to make sure we are reflecting. Uh, what private developments have been approved uh, through local review processes and what our local data, uh, your local data and information can tell us about the scale and timing uh, of these developments. Um, so one discovery from building that data set and, and using it in our forecasting work um, is really just a sheer number of housing units uh, included in large master plan communities uh, throughout the region. Uh, and I'll pause one second just to make sure everyone knows, don't equate my usage of master plan communities with like any official real estate centric definition. We're definitely just using it kind of as a generic uh, catch all, but you can see um, uh, the location of these on the map uh, and uh, sort of the headline on the, on the slide sort of notes that uh, these developments alone include over 200,000 uh, housing units that have already uh, been approved just taking the five largest of these communities uh, and combining them, you're up to 70,000 units uh, just between uh, those five large uh, master plan communities. Uh, the bullets on the slide actually are kind of bringing forward maybe some data implications uh, for my team, uh, maybe a little more inside baseball, but I thought the group might find it instructive. Um, many of these developments have development phases that extend beyond 2050. 2050 is the current horizon year for our forecast products. Uh, as well as the horizon year that will be associated with the upcoming regional transportation plan. Uh, so for our work, accounting for the phasing of what will be built when, uh, particularly uh, what will be built by 2050, is really important. 
Um, and, and additionally, as we've noted in previous uh, presentations, and I kind of made a note of this a few minutes ago, um, the current expectations for growth outlined by the State Demography Office assume a pretty significant deceleration of growth over the next 30 years, uh, particularly the last 20 years of the forecast between 2030 and 2050. Uh, so our challenge on the forecast sort of data side of this in particular uh, is the degree to which we should uh, and do uh, assert that these la large scale developments will continue as expected, um, even as the expected growth totals in the region and county and, and county by county shrink. Uh, so to kind of give you a reminder from something we shared uh, uh, back in September, uh, we anticipate, uh, this is again based on the state demography office county level forecast, uh, that between 2030 and 2040, uh, the household growth will basically be approximately 75% of what the experienced, uh, what the region experienced between 2010 and 2020. And going out a decade, 2040 to 2050, about half the number of additional households that were added between 2010 and 2020. So just, just something to think about uh, in terms of the assumptions that are made uh, within the forecast. Um, so the next few slides will kind of focus on a geography that's always been really important in regional conversations about growth, um, urban centers. Um, Metrovision, the Metrovision plan recognizes uh, these local priority growth areas. Currently there are 105 uh, in total um, and the board has established uh, regional targets uh, uh, related to the share of the region's household and employment growth or employment that will be in these locations. You can see those target shares uh, for both uh, housing and employment on the left hand side, that's kind of where the, the arrows are originating from. Um, on the right-hand side is really kind of reflecting the forecast. Um, so you'll see uh, that we're inching toward uh, the household target, uh, but anticipating fall, uh, falling well short of the target, even when measuring for 2050 rather than 2040, which is really where the target is set. Um, and unfortunately, on the jobs uh, side of this, we actually don't show any progress at all, uh, and in fact, are moving uh, in, in, in the wrong, wrong direction. I'll pause for just a second on, on this slide because frankly, it's, it's sharing pretty similar information uh, to what was on the previous slide. Um, just adding some recent observations, those orange points, uh, kind of the, the desired trend line um, going out to the year 2040 uh, that would be needed to, to meet uh, that target and then adding in uh, that 2050 forecast uh, line. So you could probably visually imagine uh, some of these trend lines uh, in the previous slide, but just want to kind of wanted to complete the visual uh, for everyone. Um, I'll just go ahead and state uh, the obvious. Uh, as staff has referred to these presentations as kind of a gap analysis, uh, illuminating potential gaps where they exist between outcomes, objectives, and performance targets set by the board. And the Metrovision plan and our current growth trajectory as outlined in this forecast, it's pretty clear this is sort of an unequivocal gap uh, between uh, where we expect to be in the future based on recent efforts to develop the forecast and where we want to go uh, as a region as established by the board. A few more since urban centers, obviously urban centers are a key part of kind of conversations that have happened over the last 10 or 15 years. I'll, I'll add just a few more slides uh, on this. Uh, this. This first one um, really just sort of um, just sort of points to maybe one sort of thing to keep in mind in terms of where there may need to be a renewed focus uh, on these areas if the region can reasonably expect to achieve uh, those goals. Um, the degree to which some progress is being made uh, and this is really frankly being bolstered by two really unique uh, outlier uh, urban centers, uh, the I-25 uh, corridor generally, uh, I-25 South corridor generally bounded by Quincy Avenue to the north and Lincoln Avenue to the south and downtown Denver, uh, the central business district. Uh, as you can see on the chart, uh, these two urban centers significantly outpace uh, the other 103 urban centers in terms of both household and employment growth uh, plotted as job growth on the y-axis and household growth on the x-axis. So they, these two are really sort of pulling up uh, the performance of the entire uh, set of, of urban centers as designated and recognized in, in the plan. Um, maybe this is a slight uh, glimmer of hope. Um, again, some urban center data, I don't really want to oversell that, uh, uh, but it does offer some, maybe some data perspective uh, on this. And I'll start with maybe the, the part of the story that's less rosy. 
um, what you're looking at is sort of a separation between, to call it something, highest performing urban centers based on 2020 and your lower performing urban centers in 2020. Really, that just means how many have, which ones have high levels of, of households and jobs today versus those that do not. Uh, so the blue bars are those that have a fair amount of uh, development today. The green bars uh, do not. Um, so maybe the bad news first, pretty easy to pick up uh, that the recently completed forecast shows very little growth, household or employment, uh, and currently recognized urban centers that don't actually have existing concentrations of household uh, and employment uh, today. Uh, on the other side of that, uh, the first decade of the forecast, the very left-hand side of the um, slide, uh, that sort of first set of vertical bars shows pretty strong household and employment growth uh, for those higher performing centers, those that actually have a fair amount of development uh, already. Um, but you can also see that some of this even tails off um, uh, throughout uh, the, the course of the forecast period. And really, I think our general feeling of, about that is that this is probably connected to the master plan community slide that you saw. Um, those are really large developments that have been on the books for decades uh, with development phases that have extended in some cases beyond 2050. Uh, that issue of having a lot of sort of development on the books uh, combined with uh, sort of that growth deceleration that I mentioned, frankly creates for us as we are trying to sort of place and distribute uh, future growth and household employment, um, a really competitive uh, situation about where to place uh, those future uh, jobs and households. Uh, urban center developments are, are frankly not likely to have as long of a development window as some of these master plan communities. Uh, so our best data sources uh, really aren't going to be accounting uh, for anything other than you know existing recent uh, approvals uh, for uh, developments happening within urban centers, but it will not account for for approvals that may be coming up over the next year, year or two, five years, uh, ten years compared to those master plan communities that have approved, approved development plans that maybe extend out with 30 year uh, build outs. Um, getting close to the end here, um, a few sort of one slide about sort of this notion of, of employment centers. Uh, Metrovision uh, notes the importance of not only urban centers, but also employment centers, um, specifically noting the importance of improving access to these locations. Um, unlike urban centers, uh, employment centers are not really a known or specific geography in the plan. They aren't lined on a map, uh, but we do try to attempt uh, to understand them better um, as a geography uh, because it does, uh, it's obviously uh, an important part of, of understanding the region and, um, uh, and can be a part of work that we do as, as well as work that happens uh, locally. Uh, so for this analysis, we're attempting to map uh, employment centers by looking for small areas of job densities with, with six jobs per acre or more, and then sort of building contiguous areas uh, that when aggregated combine for 10,000 or more jobs. So really big uh, concentrations of jobs uh, throughout the region in kind of a geographically uh, defined area. You saw some examples of existing job centers and that really confusing slide that sort of uh, was rooted in sort of distance from the from the Daniels and Fisher Tower. Um, so Quick sort of uh, uh, summary from what you see on the slide. Um, continue to see, the region will continue to see an aggregation of jobs into employment centers, both the, the, those that exist today and new centers that emerge over the next three decades. These could be centers um, uh, that exist today and simply just expand just to continued, uh, just because of continued job growth. Uh, in some cases, they could be employment centers that are grow because they are connected by uh, travel corridors uh, that see a fair amount of growth as well uh, during uh, this, this period. Um, so as you can see on the table, um, at some point during this decade, uh, this current decade, we actually reach a point where the majority of the region's jobs are located in these centers, reaching about 60% of jobs uh, in uh, employment centers by the year 2050. And just as a note um, there, that's, that's so again, in 2050, that's 57% of the region's jobs uh, being located in a really small concentrated land area, about 2% of the land area uh, is needed to support uh, nearly 60% of the jobs um, in the region. Thank you. So we'll take a couple more questions at sure. this point. If any people have questions or comments, the first question is from Director Atchison. I think you're muted on your end. Okay. Hey, Brad, just looking for some short feedback. Um, 
with 2020, and I'll call it an anomaly, with the downturn we saw in employment, that's heavily on the service industry side, but yet we're seeing a good deal of growth in the geospatial, aerospace, and some elements of manufacturing, which is driving up the availability of housing being in short supply. Even uh, most recently, we're still seeing a short supply of housing. How do you think that's going to affect us in, in the projections that you're making? Uh, I kind of, I'll, thanks, Mayor. Um, but just qu a quick kind of gut reaction on some of that. And that with, with maybe the big caveat is I don't think anyone quite knows yet. Uh, we need to get to the other side of this and see how sectors of the economy respond to whatever new normal is, to use probably an overused uh, term. Um, you know, much like you saw and sort of thinking about um, sort of the quiz slides, I mean, obviously you saw city and county of Denver get hammered uh, during that 2000 to 2010 period, but then obviously a fair amount of recovery as well. Uh, in this case, it's a matter of what recovery looks like. Um, you mentioned sort of those sectors that have been really um, hard hit uh, by sort of the response to the public health emergency itself and the response to, the, to, to COVID. Um, one of the things that I, I know folks are, have been thinking about that, again, is really, there's no answer yet, is sector, a sector like healthcare uh, that is a really strong growth sector going forward, how many of those jobs that are really in the sort of um, meet and greet, welcome people to sort of uh, that healthcare setting uh, that are now being uh, done with low contact, maybe even more machine-based sort of check-in procedures, how many of those just simply don't come back? Uh, and that's probably true across particularly sort of the retail sector as well. I mean, these are obviously, many of those are kind of your lower wage uh, jobs. But I mean, that will be um, among the things that I think folks will pay attention to is those that really uh, suffered pretty tremendous losses. Uh, what is the strength of those coming back? Any follow-up questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Calvert. Great. Well, I'm, I promise you, I'm, not, I'm on the very short tail end here. So, uh, just um, maybe one more uh, slide that kind of just it's actually something that kind of sits outside of uh, the gap analysis data that we're bringing for tonight. But I think it's instructive uh, for how these assumptions ultimately sort of inform maybe some other regional efforts that identify gaps and priorities. Uh, so this is kind of related to uh, 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 an initiative being pursued by the Metro Denver Nature Alliance, uh, which is a partner of Dr. Cog. Uh, that group, of, of that coalition of sort of nature-based organizations has re recently kicked off an effort to create what they're calling a regional conservation assessment. Uh, that will identify you know, lands and waters to protect, connect, restore, and enhance. Uh, with people, uh, our region's growth and our natural assets in mind, um, the region's assumptions about growth, which I just really kind of shared um, maybe some details on, uh, will really help, like, for example, this project team understand uh, where people are today, uh, where they will be in the future, uh, as they develop that plan to increase access to high quality connected uh, conservation networks uh, that both support the ecological function uh, of the system, as well as uh, supporting community health and just access to outdoor recreation in general. So, I mean, just an example of one way that these uh, forecasts make their way into kind of related efforts uh, as well. Um, as noted in the in the memo for this item and um, and really the companion item uh, that the board saw in October, uh, really this is about uh, staff bringing forward uh, information uh, related to uh, the forecast as sort of a, an anticipated growth trajectory. Uh, and what we're really trying uh, to do is is um, understand uh, sort of your insights and collect those insights on the implications of those growth patterns and you know, really sort of boiling that, boiling that down. Um, do the current assumptions suggest we were headed in, towards achieving uh, MetroVision outcomes or is there more work to do uh, to ensure success? Uh, in October, the board offered a few key pieces of guidance to staff that are sort of reflected on the slide um, that you would be interested in. This came up again sort of this evening as well. Um, a deeper dive on the topic of attainable or affordable housing, uh, including information on where those units are being built, uh, what are the best practices to support affordable unit production, and what we co can collectively learn about recent efforts to, to in, uh, increase that portfolio. Uh, additionally, the board expressed interest in exploring and learning about uh, new data sources 
uh, related to affordable and attainable housing that would help uh, local, sub-regional, and regional uh, planning uh, efforts. Uh, as we noted in October, a lot of the current data sources just have a really significant lag, um, limiting the utility for current, more current strategic and tactical uh, planning efforts. Uh, in October, the board uh, also noted the importance of aligning efforts with the state's um, efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, given the emphasis on this issue in MetroVision, staff feels comfortable that we have existing board direction to pursue additional analysis. And the same is true uh, on uh, for urban centers, which obviously there are a few slides on this evening as well, uh, and how uh, we may be able to make additional progress on, on those outcomes and measures and targets uh, for that topic uh, as well. So um, I appreciate the question so far, but at this point, really kind of the uh, the virtual floor is definitely uh, uh, the uh, the boards. Uh, we're interested in hearing from you. Um, as as I just sort of mentioned, this is really about kind of generating leads uh, to call it something for additional uh, conversations. Uh, the things that you noted in October are really exactly what we're looking for this afternoon as well. Um, in addition to some of the things that came up uh, with a few questions uh, they were asked uh, already. And then just sort of quick note on next steps. Uh, these are the same that I mentioned in October, but to quickly summarize, we're really sort of collecting uh, feedback now so that we can have more targeted uh, uh, discussion uh, in the future. Um, and so while this is a pretty open uh, conversation, meaning that we don't necessarily have a specific or known deliverable uh, that this input will shape, we are um, do have a scheduled MetroVision amendment in 2021 and um, primarily seeking to align that with the regional transportation plan, but there may be an opportunity to bring some of this conversation uh, into that update as, as well. So with that, I, I'll, that's concludes my presentation. Happy to hear any observations, uh, respond to any questions or uh, whatever's the good of the group. Thank you so much. And you know, it's really hard to do these presentations without getting to see everybody's face and interact. And I appreciate how much you put into that. It was really interesting. If any directors have comments, questions, future topics they'd like to bring up at this time, now is your time to shine. Go ahead and raise your hand there. It's the little um, strange looking shape in the attendee panel that somewhat resembles a hand. Um, so go ahead and raise that now if you'd like to make a comment. Our first director with comments or questions is Director Kemi Nauer. Hello, um, good evening and thank you, Brad. Great presentation. Yeah, and some of those slides were really involved. Um, yeah, just something that just hit me at the last topic that you mentioned about the, you know, Denver Metro Regional Conservative Assessment. I don't know if we're looking at that totally regionally. Is there anything that we are looking at to support as far as fire mitigation moving forward? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, uh, thanks, Director Mayer. I'll mention sort of two things on that. Um, there actually is, it's, it's maybe less on the sort of fire mitigation side, it's just more on the on the vulnerability side in general. There actually is a MetroVision performance uh, uh, measure related to those, to call it something sort of uh, fire and flood susceptibility and, um, and growth in those areas. Um, and then the conservation assessment will very much look at um, susceptibility to hazards uh, as, as part of that, and that is that is a regional uh, initiative. And in fact, um, they are currently forming a leadership council right now, and that leadership council is going to be pretty heavily uh, drawn uh, from uh, state and federal partners as well as uh, local open space managers and programs. So there certainly will be a, a perspective that will be directing uh, the work of that group. Thank you, Thank Director. You. Sorry to interrupt. I was just asking Director Mauer if you had any follow up there. No, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next director with comments or questions is Director Moldy. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we sure can. Thank you. Um, Brad, on the the graphic that had households on tops and jobs in the bottom and the distances indicated from the Daniels and Fisher Tower, the thing that um, I observed that concerned me was the increase in distance that we're seeing in the housing growth from the job location. 
And knowing, of course, that that might change because of COVID and the trends we're seeing with work from home, um, I'd, I, I'd like to see whether or not that's a concern. You know, people having to commute further for a job in light of the fact that we saw on the previous slides increase in jobs in the outer line counties. So it seems on the one hand a little inconsistent, but then also on the other hand a little bit concerning if the, the purple, orange, green, blue graph with the DNF tower distances was what we're working from. And so that's more of an observation, question, concern, follow-up kind of comment. I don't know sure. what category to put that in. And I'll mention one sort of caveat that I didn't mention earlier it was on a slide, but I've, I've mentioned it a few times. I just, and I, I promise I was trying to be relatively expedient. Um, we are really kind of sharing sort of observations or implications really strictly on the sort of the forecast side of this, the actual location of household and employment growth, uh, in addition to the existing uh, households and employment that are here uh, today. Um, the board will hear um, uh, more about sort of the transportation implications uh, of that um, as you begin to see more of the regional transportation plan. Uh, so they they are very much our colleagues over in the transportation division are are really gearing up uh, to share uh, some observations of how this uh, set of growth assumptions, in addition to um, existing transportation uh, network as well as future. Uh, networks based on uh, those investments in the RTP, really kind of what the travel side of the story is. Uh, so that may be pretty instructive to to the point you just brought forward. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. Thank you. The next director with questions or comments is Director Brockett. Can you hear me? Yes, we sure can. Thanks. So, Brad, thanks so much for that uh, presentation. Is very interesting, and that uh, visualization of the distance from Daniels and Fisher's Tower, I've never seen anything quite like it. That was really, really fascinating. Thanks for that. Kudos to whoever put that together. Um, so just a couple of things. I wanted to echo Director Sandgren's uh, point about the doing, uh, looking more into the affordable and attainable housing. So you've heard that several times, I think. So that, that would be a great deep dive to do at some point in the future. Um, and then the other thing was, so you're showing about how we're not on track to hit those MetroVision targets is something that would be really interesting to know would be what kinds of policies or land use changes um, that um, member governments could take that would uh, put us a little bit closer to on track to meet those targets. So you know, you've shown us the forecast about how we're, you know, what's forecast and how that's different. And so then the next question would be, what could we do differently uh, to bring those closer together and reduce that gap. So I'd, I'd be very interested in, in a presentation or some discussion around that sometime. Great, thank you, happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Director Brockett. Any other questions or comments or future items around this that folks would like to raise now for future exploration? All right, seeing no one else in the queue, we'll thank uh, Mr. Calvert very much for that excellent presentation. And that'll close out this agenda item. So the next agenda item this afternoon is a briefing on the Wellness Fund. We're going to get a presentation from Mr. Dimitopoulos, but first I'll turn it over to our Area Agency on Aging Director, Jayla Sanchez Warren, for an introduction. Jayla? Hi, everyone. So happy to talk with you tonight. Um, AJ is gonna give you a presentation. AJ is uh, uh, does business development for us and is the manager of our Accountable Health Communities uh, demonstration project with, with uh, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare. And this program kind of bridges the gap between uh, uh, the needs in clinical settings and the services in community. So we're trying to help uh, people coming out of the hospital stay out of the hospital and not go back by providing community services. And he's, uh, we're the only area agency on aging in the country to do this, um, to get this demonstration project. There are others, but not area agencies on aging. 
So I will let him talk to you about the Wellness Fund. Thank you very much. Uh, can you all see my screen? We can, we can see the notes. Um, it's not in full screen though, just yet. There we go. I'm gonna be put in charge of the technology portion. So thank you. It looks um, right. Uh, uh, thank you, Jayla. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, uh, as uh, Jayla mentioned, uh, uh, my name is AJ Damantopoulos. I manage the Accountable Health Communities. Um, uh, starting off, I'll just say um, uh, kudos to the chair for getting my last name correct. That's that's quite a feat. Um, so I want to jump right in. About a year ago, I uh, uh, came to a board work session and told you about um, one healthcare initiative that was going to dramatically uh, increase the number of referrals that healthcare organizations make to community organizations to address what are called health-related social needs. Uh, those are things like food, transportation, utilities, housing, um, and safety concerns. Uh, and in that time, uh, since I last spoke to you, uh, there have been two more initiatives that have been added to the queue that will also greatly increase the number of uh, referrals to community-based organizations. I'm gonna take you through those uh, at a high level, um, <clears throat> and then I will tell you what uh, we're planning to do uh, in response. So the first one is the Hospital Transformation Program. Um, and I'll start by uh, describing, uh, some of you may have heard of the hospital provider fee. Uh, this is a fee to increase payment to healthcare providers to or hospitals to serve health uh, Medicaid patients. Um, the, you might have heard of it that it um, it put us right up against the Tabor cap and so had to be uh, moved into an enterprise fund. <clears throat> that fund is called the Chase uh, Fund, uh, Chase Enterprise Board, um, and it is uh, roughly around $1.3 billion. And basically what they do is they um, place a fee on uh, hospitals for every Medicaid patient that is in their hospital as an inpatient every day. Uh, let's say it's $50. And they use the um, matching process uh, of the Medicaid program with the federal government. And that fee is matched at, at um, uh, 50%. And so $50 turns into $100. Uh, and they give that money back to the hospital just um, as uh, a, a check. Uh, now, honestly, the, the numbers are quite a bit larger than what I just described, but moving forward with the hospital transformation program, some of that uh, money that they get back will be tied to uh, activities that they accomplish uh, to improve care and lower costs. And one of those uh, measures are the uh, screening and referral of Medicaid beneficiaries for housing, transportation, utilities, uh, food security, and safety. Um, along with that, each hospital has to engage in meaningful uh, engagement with their community. Uh, they have to go out and find out how those issues like food and transportation impact uh, things like readmissions to hospitals, emergency department visits, uh, and before I was, uh, I spoke today, I uh, uh, sent a message to Ron Papstorff, who's here today, uh, because the, the phrase meaningful engagement um, is an important part of this. And uh, uh, as part of the uh, engagement process, Ron was interviewed by one of the hospitals um, to find out more about transportation. He's listed in one of their uh, documents as an application to the program. Um, and he doesn't remember it. So I'm not sure that was very meaningful. And I don't mean to put Ron on the spot. He's a pretty smart guy. Uh, but they've gone to a lot of community-based organizations, all the hospitals have, uh, to find out how services like transportation and food uh, can be made available to their patients to lower the cost of care um, that they charge the state. Uh, that was pretty convoluted and pretty complex, and that was the easy version of that project or of the program. So I, I do apologize for that. Uh, the next uh, initiative I'll tell you about is something called the Social Health Information Exchange. 
Um, and this is something that is being uh, built. It's technology built by the governor's office of eHealth Innovation. They received uh, funding uh, $75 million from the federal government to uh, do many things. Five million uh, was earmarked for the social health information exchange. Um, uh, if I could see you, I'd ask for a show of hands of how many of you have heard of 211, but instead I'll just ask um, if you all remember the Yellow Pages. Um, and I think many of you uh, do. Uh, so the Yellow Pages is just a listing of all the, in this situation, the community-based resources that are available uh, to people in need. Uh, things like what the Area Agency on, Offer, Agency on Aging offers, like food and transportation and some uh, housing counseling, if you're seeing a, a pattern here. Um, on the other side, in, in health systems, in hospitals and in, in primary care, you may have noticed at your last doctor's appointment, um, instead of looking at you, your doctor was typing into a computer and they have digitized their filing system and they call it an electronic health record. It's very uh, fancy and very effective. Um, the Social Health Information Exchange is a combination of the yellow pages and the electronic health record. So it's a yellow pages that's digitized um, and placed in the electronic health record so that when your provider uh, asks you, uh, do you need help with um, food? Uh, and you say yes, they can literally press a button and a referral will be sent to um, uh, a community-based organization on your behalf uh, to help you uh, meet your food need, which uh, in the long term is a very positive development. But when you pair these two initiatives, the hospital transformation program, which incentivizes the payment um, to hospitals uh, for the uh, screening and referral of patients, and the social health information exchange, which literally makes it one button to push. Um, we're very concerned that this will overwhelm many community-based organizations. Um, the Area Agency on Aging is one of them. The third initiative is uh, uh, just went active. It'll go uh, in a kind of a beta test. Um, it'll go uh, full, fully active in March of 2021. Um, and it is the, um, Unite Colorado Community Network. And it is basically a social health information exchange that Kaiser Permanente as uh, a provider and insurance company has built and is making available uh, to community organizations. But in it is the um, added uh, complexity that they're asking community-based organizations to not only accept the referrals and the, provide the services, but um, give information back on the services they deliver for the patients or clients that were referred to them. Um, I guess, I think this would be a good time to, to ask if there's any questions. If any directors have questions at this time, go ahead and raise your hand. Not, oh, we do have one from Director Mulvey. It looks like yours. There we go. Yeah, I'm sorry. I I don't have my mouse out and I'm trying to tap this tablet and it's not working. I apologize. No problem. Um, this may sound a little unpopular in terms of thinking, but I I do see the increased cost. I don't know if that's something you're highlighting there, but it seems to be somewhat of an increased cost burden on some of the entities that are providing some of the community-based services. But aside from that, I'm also seeing that, and this is the unpopular part, but um, sometimes I look at the issues that might come in as a as a problem. And when I look at the hospitals getting incentives for screening and referring Medicaid patients, I'm wondering, it, and it's called a transformation program. It, it sounds an awful lot like somebody's trying to make a big change that's bigger than just helping people. And, and it seems a little bit of a, a red flag to me in my mind. And I'm wondering, what is there more to it than that? It, it just concerns me. Um, uh, thank you for the question. And yes, there's a, there's a lot more to it. Um, it is called the transformation program because uh, it is uh, um, designed to transition hospitals and, and health systems 
away from the reimbursement system they are currently used to, fee for service. Uh, every action is reimbursed uh, to what they call value-based purchasing or, or, pay for, or pay for outcomes. Um, and uh, there are many more moving parts to the hospital transformation program than, than what I've described to you. Um, but uh, the main uh, thing that we're focusing on is the measure that will uh, increase the referrals to community-based organizations, as well as the um, engagement process that uh, requires actions by the community-based organizations uh, to help the, the health systems and hospitals. Um, but you're absolutely right. It is, it is a much bigger um, uh, project than what I've described here. Well, I appreciate that somewhat tangential uh, question of mine. But uh, so then the, to the first point, then it does seem like it would increase the workload in, in your realm? Very much so. Uh, it increased the administrative costs and, and which in turn, uh, if nothing changes, decreases the, uh, the funding available for services themselves. And I'll um, get to a little bit of that uh, in just a moment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands at this time, so we'll just go on. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, so uh, just a little bit of background here, as um, uh, I'm sure many of you are, are aware, uh, right now the community-based organizations uh, like the Area Agency on Aging or, or, and many of the uh, organizations we fund through it are already at service capacity. Uh, we were seeing this a little bit in February of this year. And then of course, uh, you know, March and April hit with um, the reality that they brought and, and uh, wait lists ballooned. Um, Compounding that issue is the limited funding currently uh, available to community-based uh, services. Um, the state and local funds don't increase as needs increase. And, and it's usually um, very hard to be flexible with the dollars you do have. And philanthropic uh, funding is also limited. Um, so we're seeing the situation where um, community-based services are, are really needed um, and they're uh, not available. We're also seeing added to this um, the situation where in, in a few short months, uh, healthcare is going to be paid to send referrals to community-based organizations. So something's got to give. Um, and then you add on to it uh, the public health emergency, COVID-19. Waiting lists just ballooned, uh, services dropped. Um, and uh, community-based organizations were, were hesitant uh, to expand with CARES Act because it, it created a fiscal cliff where they would expand and then have to quickly retract. And that was not uh, a desirable situation for them. I should say on average, some, some uh, many made different decisions. Um, okay, so to, I, I never know quite where to put this slide, but um, to explain to you uh, why uh, I've been able to in contact with all these different initiatives and, and uh, develop a, a, a potential solution for the uh, problem they have created is um, what I call my day job. Um, and that is I manage the accountable health communities, which Jayla alluded to or, or mentioned earlier. Uh, there are 29 AHCs uh, in the country. Uh, we are a, a model test of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid to try and understand how community-based services lower healthcare costs and improve um, outcomes. Uh, to do that, we work with um, nine clinical sites where we screen uh, Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries of all ages for uh, the same five needs I've, I've mentioned a few times, housing, transportation, utilities, food security, and safety. And we're working with those uh, clinical sites to figure out the best workflow to screen everyone um, when they report a need to then send referrals to community-based organizations. And we're what's known as the bridge organization. We do the project management, but we also create links between clinical and community-based organizations. Um, and so far, uh, we're in our, our fourth year of um, funding, third year of operations. Um, and we've, we've, we're out in front of, uh, by about two years of the hospital transformation program um, and the social health information exchange. Uh, and we've learned uh, 
a lot of lessons. So to give you an idea, um, uh, so far in the past 30 months, we've screened 32,000 people of all ages. Um, we've found that 34% of them have at least one need. Uh, and of all the referrals we've sent, uh, we, we estimate that about 50% of those referrals do not result in services. Uh, some for reasons like it was the wrong type of organization uh, that received the referral. Uh, others are the, the client uh, opted not to pursue the, the service. Um, but many of it uh, is related to the fact that uh, there was no capacity in the community-based organizations to provide that service. The people went on a wait list. Um, and that's been uh, one of our bigger frustrations. Uh, and the main lesson we have learned, which I have been um, shouting from the rooftops in all of the meetings I've attended with these, uh, with the folks who are working on these initiatives I've detailed is, Referrals don't actually change healthcare outcomes or lower costs. Services delivered um, lower costs and change outcomes for the better. Um, and it's surprising that we have to say that so many times to uh, get people to remember it, um, but it is very true. Um, and so what we're uh, proposing is we're, we're seeing a, a decrease in service capacity in the community organizations and increase in referrals from uh, healthcare organizations. And what we've uh, developed is something called a wellness fund. It's an evolution of the accountable health community, and it's designed to increase the service capacity of community-based organizations so they are able to deliver services uh, when they receive referrals. And so uh, the dream would be to always uh, operate without a wait list. Um, but we're going to do things uh, to get as close to that as possible. Um, oh, excuse me. Uh, we're uh, working with uh, several stakeholders and trying to uh, identify funding um, so that we can make investments in, in needs uh, to uh, identify which needs impact the cost of care and quality outcomes the most and invest in them. Um, so, in, a, in my uh, dream world, uh, we were given a, a very large check tomorrow. Uh, and these three steps are, are what we would follow to, to make those investments. So we would uh, engage stakeholders, uh, community representatives, uh, uh, every, anybody you can think of to find out what is it that is actually affecting um, communities, uh, quality of life and, and healthcare costs, uh, engage with them and, and get to the bottom from a more qualitative perspective. What is what is going on and how can we help? We identify those community-based services that have that effect on healthcare costs and outcomes, and then we invest in things uh, to make it possible. So from the accountable health communities, I know um, uh, last, last month, 27% uh, of the people we screened reported uh, a food security issue. Uh, they were worried that they would run out of food by the end of the month and not have enough money to, to buy more. Uh, so uh, that's held true. About 27% of all people we've screened in 30 months have reported food security. Um, and so we would probably work on food first. Um, and we would invest in things like ovens, um, uh, recipes and ingredients. Uh, space to make the food uh, a delivery uh, opportunity if, if one was necessary, um, IT support for community-based organizations. Um, I mentioned that healthcare uses electronic health records and they have the social health information exchange. Community-based organizations are still working on paper and Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel. And so there's a technology imbalance that we need to, uh, to remedy uh, to really make this um, system of referral and service work. Um, uh, I wish I had invented this idea, but it is an evolution of, of several that have uh, gone before it. Uh, one example is Massachusetts um, uh, created the Prevention and Wellness Trust Fund. Uh, they uh, levied a tax, which apparently you can only do in, in Massachusetts, um, and they raised $57 million. And they uh, did uh, just what I was describing, but they took a more um, clinical approach, they worked on things like um, uh, decreasing emergency department visits and um, uh, other things in the community like falls prevention and to a limited degree, um, food security. 
they helped fund a few um, food banks. Um, they worked uh, a lot on um, uh, inequities and, and reducing inequities in their communities, and they were very successful. Um, another one is in California. There are 13 organizations that are called um, uh, Accountable Communities for Health or and, uh, catchy sites. Um, they were funded by a consortium of payers uh, like Kaiser and uh, Anthem's foundation. Um, the state chipped in some dollars and the, the federal, they used some federal funds from another program. And they created 13 of these um, ACHs, which had wellness funds. And they uh, pooled their resources and they worked together to um, invest in the, uh, the gaps that existed to close them, to help people uh, be healthier and uh, lower their cost of care. And so um, uh, the reason I'm here today is to, to update you on the, the progress I've made in, uh, with my team to develop a, a wellness fund. Um, so uh, I believe the uh, Strategic Action Planning Group on Aging has uh, recommended to the uh, governor's office that two wellness fund pilots be created. Um, those would be based on the two accountable health communities here in Colorado. Um, and I've, I've gone around and I've um, recruited a stakeholder group to help us implement a, a pilot. Um, uh, and we've uh, asked them to do uh, two um, important things. One is uh, to convene and help us figure out uh, what the structure of the wellness fund should be so that it would um, address many of the issues they're working on. And so we were aligned. And uh, part of the stakeholder group are organizations like the Governor's Office of eHealth Innovation, um, uh, a couple of health systems, uh, many community organizations, uh, and a representative uh, from the Governor's Office. Um, and the second part of uh, what we've asked them to do is to help identify funding for the creation of, of this wellness fund. Um, and we had a, a very interesting development uh, a few weeks ago. Um, we spoke to uh, a, a, a division director, excuse me, a, a system level director at uh, SCL Health about the wellness funds. Um, and she was uh, very excited about it. And she asked uh, to help us um, put together a meeting of other hospitals with the intention of asking them to invest in the wellness fund so that they would fund it and we would use it to help them uh, conduct that meaningful engagement and develop the services they would need uh, in the hospital transformation program. Uh, that is uh, one option we're, we're currently pursuing, but it's uh, so far our best option for funding. Um, however, uh, I don't know um, to be nervous or not, but it's uh, ever since the COVID cases spiked, we haven't heard from any of our healthcare partners, so we're still waiting to um, schedule that meeting. Um, and with that, uh, I apologize if I've glossed over too much. I'm uh, looking out a window, staring at myself uh, in the dark. So if you have any questions, please, uh, please let me know. Thank you for the visual. Uh, any direct questions <laughs> at this point? Uh, if, if I could say something, this is Jayla. Great. Director Sanchez Warren, please. Thank you. Um, what the reason this is so concerning for us, as as AJ said, is that you know these hospitals are going to be able to make referrals to to the area agency on aging and to Arapahoe County and to Senior Hub and to a uh, aging resource center of Douglas County, and um, they're going to expect that they make the referral, the agency provides the service, um, and then reports back to them. On, uh, uh, on the success of that service. Well, the hospital gets paid to make those referrals, so they're gonna make lots of them, but we don't, the community-based organizations don't get paid to provide the service. And so we're really nervous about that. We're really nervous that we're gonna get a bad reputation as community-based services. Um, and that people that that Ada has been doing a really good job, but that folks don't understand that we're at capacity already. We're also concerned that 
these services could then become medicalized. And when you medicalize like transportation services, they're so much more expensive. So some of these things that you're seeing in the Medicare Advantage commercials right now, because it's open enroll enrollment, and you're seeing lots of Medicare um, uh, commercials, they're talking about, you know, Medicare Advantage can pay for your transportation and they can pay for food. Well, on a Medicare Advantage, we pay $8, almost $9 for a meal. They're paying over $35 for a meal. So we don't want um, those services to be medicalized and, and cost so much for the taxpayers because it really is all of us that are paying for that. Um, and you know this is going to take a fair amount of money and a fair amount of investment, as as AJ described. Um, but we can't just go to the government and say, "Please help us." We're not going to get it that way. We have to come up with a different solution. And so um, AJ has been actively involved in many committees uh, and and uh, recognized at a national level um, on on trying to find solutions to help us build the capacity to serve folks. We were worried about serving the population as it aged, and now um, we're even gonna have more of a demand very shortly. Um, as, as AJ described, the Kaiser Unite Us platform is gonna go live in, in March, and that's, that's really scary for us. So this is a way um, that we're hoping to pursue to get more funds to, to help um, build capacity in our region and serve people. And if I could just add to that, thank you, Jayla. Um, you know, the, the AHC uh, works across the lifespan, so not just with uh, older adults, but that 30% of people who are screened that have a need, that's been pretty standard across the, the 29 AHC sites. Um, and if you think about it, in our region, there's about 650,000 people on Medicaid uh, and uh, a few more 100,000 on Medicare. Um, that's something on the order of 150, 250,000 people with needs. Uh, that would probably not reach that level, but that's a, a tremendous increase from what we're used to seeing. Thank you. The uh, next person with their hand raised is Director Shaw. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to AJ and Jayla for this presentation and for really pointing out that it is not the referral, it is the fulfillment of the need that makes the difference. Um, and for, for seeking funding, um, I think that over the last couple of years, you've been looking for ways to uh, try and fund this, um, kind of starting to prove that uh, if you provide these services, people don't end up in the hospital. So it it makes our healthcare uh, uh, services far more efficient by keeping people out of the hospitals when. Uh, all they really need is food and water <laughs> and someone yeah. to remind them to uh, to do that. So, um, you know, the I, I love that we're doing a pilot. If it goes forward, maybe, you know, I know people are conflicted when they see uh, people on the street, but, uh, you know, asking for, for money. But if they're um, might be a uh, like a phone app so that people could throw a couple of bucks in here every time they see someone who is looking for money and say these people can help you. Um, I just made a donation. <laughs> um, <laughs> this might really catch on, and and it would be wonderful if it if it could. Um, if the funding sources could be sustainable and really we could make an improvement in the way, the quality of people's lives. So thank you. Thank you. Any other directors with comments or questions this evening? All I'm right. chair. Is this um, Director Rex? Yes, thank you very much and good evening, everybody. Um, listen, the reason we wanted to present this to you all today is because of uh, um, it's on this last slide that the that the 
the Strategic Action Planning Group on Aging is planning on making a recommendation to the governor's office. So we wanted you all to be aware that this is happening um, in the event that you know there there is um, this is received um, well by by the governor's office that we might um, then rely on our directors to probably provide some additional oomph, maybe get this get this to a place in which we we wanted to get. Um, but it's you know we're not putting all of our eggs in one basket basket either. This is this is really you know part of our funding diversification initiative that we started in AAA, understanding that there's never going to be enough federal or state money to handle the problems in our region and and um, you know fund it to an adequate level. Um, so in at our regular business meeting in December, um, Rich Morrow is going to provide a presentation on a on a on a working group that he established over the summer looking at some other funding strategies as well, um, which I think you'll be interested in. But, you know, but I would like to extend, um, you know, my gratitude to AJ and, and, and Jayla and all staff that for the tremendous work that they're doing in this, you know, we're playing, we're playing in a world that we, quite frankly, have not had a lot of experience in, right? Um, but we need to, and AJ has been fabulous. And I know Dr. Mark Levine is on the phone who's been tremendous uh, help for us too in getting us indoors that quite frankly, we probably don't have any business getting into <laughs> um, and, and helping us strategize and coming up with, a, with a, you know, a possible solution or at least a path. So I just want to thank everybody for their efforts on this and we're going to continue to pursue this as aggressively as possible because ultimately it's about our older adults and, and getting them the services that we know we, we get them the services that, that we want them to have. So stay tuned. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just finding my mute button. Thank you um, for the great comments and thank you to the presenters um, this afternoon. Really great presentations today. Um, so that takes us to the end of the meeting. Um, so we'll have our regular work session later this month. Look forward to seeing everybody at that. And in the meantime, everybody just do your best with your mask wearing and social distancing and hand washing. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good night, everyone.